All right, welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. Last night after the market closed, Zoom out with its latest quarterly results. And as you can see here, a blowout quarter for the company revenue, almost totaling a billion dollars in the company's most recent quarter. Adjusted earnings per share beating estimates by 34 cents. And Zoom CFO Kelly Steckelberg joins us now to talk about the latest quarter and the future for the business. So Kelly, let's talk about something that came up quite a bit on the call, which is um, that mix in terms of customer size. You continue to see um, smaller customers coming uh, on the platform, but also retaining some big enterprise accounts. I think uh, 2,000 customers, if I have it right, with more than 100,000 in annual billings. What's the mix been like and, and how do you expect that to evolve You know, as we kind of head through the year and, and the years ahead here? Yeah, we were really excited about our momentum in Q1. We signed our largest deal to date with a large financial institution. There were also some amazing customers that we talked about on the call yesterday, including Kimberly Clark, Target, and Denso. So we continue to see momentum in the up market. And as you said, we had 1,999 customers with greater than $100,000 of trailing 12 month revenue. So we continue to see strength. And I think, as we all know, there's uncertainty about the future of work, but what we all know is it's not gonna be the same as it was before. So as organizations are thinking about how they start to welcome their employees back into the office, they're gonna do that in a hybrid approach and, and Zoom is a central part of that. Kelly, in this land of, of a hybrid work environment, what is a, what's a normalized growth rate, growth rate for, for a company like Zoom in terms of sales? So we gave guidance yesterday, which was in the range of 3.75 to $3.99 billion for FY22. And that is in the range of 50% year over year growth. So, you know, we had, um, you know, 300% over 300% growth last year, but at this scale, I think you're starting to see us normalize in, in a range. We haven't given future guidance beyond FY22, which is the current year that we're in. But um, we're, we're very proud of our 50% year-over-year growth and expect that to continue to moderate as we look towards um, FY23. Kelly, it's Julie here. Um, you know, I think we're starting to, to get an answer as to what Zoom looks like beyond Zoom, right? Beyond the, the company's core product with Zoom Rooms, Zoom Phone, um, where you guys now have, what, one and a half million um, people using that, individuals using that. Um, what does the full suite of services eventually look like from Zoom? What what kinds of things are you guys looking to add to further spur growth? Yeah, so we're really evolving from being the killer app of Zoom meetings that you all know and love into being Zoom the platform, which will be the communication hub. And thank you, you listed off most of those great products that we have, which Zoom Rooms, which is our conference room solution. Zoom Phone, which is our cloud PDX solution, which is a little over two years old. We also have Zoom Events, which is our corporate events platform. And then later this summer, we're gonna have Zoom Apps, which will be generally available. And that are those are apps that are being developed with third parties, amazing companies like ServiceNow, Asana, WW, Thrive, which allow you to have a very immersive and interactive experience in the meeting itself. And so all of this is gonna to come together along. We also have a, a chat product, Zoom chat. And all of that brings together an experience where you can not only communicate in Zoom, but you can also do your work here and it allows other third-party apps that you love to develop on our platform itself. Kelly, you acknowledged on the call last night that Zoom's about a year behind in its international strategy. So much focus on the U.S., and it's been a busy past 12 to 24 months. What is the international strategy this year? Yeah, so international is a huge opportunity. What we've seen over the last 15 months is an increase in our global brand awareness, as well as an acceleration of video communications adoption. I think that if you looked around the globe on a pre-pandemic basis, the use of video communications outside of the US was, was, was lagging behind. And what the pandemic has done is really accelerated that adoption um, and acceptance. And so specifically what I was talking about last night was our channel strategy, but in general, uh, international is a really key component of our ongoing growth strategy. What the global brand awareness has done is allowed us to start 
hiring salespeople in markets very quickly. And it really is a key part of our strategy, both from a direct sales execution as well as a channel strategy. And, you know, Kelly, I want to ask also about the balance sheet. I mean, you guys have almost $5 billion in cash. You got free cash flow of $500 million, um, just about $500 million in, in the last quarter. And just um, as the CFO of a company that has gone from, you know, just we're, we're putting everything back into growth, trying to build market share to having the whole world come to you. How do you guys think about that cash strategically in terms of M&A as a, a special dividend or you happen to have it sit on the balance sheet? How, how are you thinking about that? Yeah, so there are certainly areas in our own organization that we continue to focus on investment. That includes R&D. We want to keep hiring great talent around the globe, so we continue to drive innovation. Also investing in sales capacity as well as marketing as we are continuing to focus on driving top-line growth and taking market share. But on the other side of that, we are we have a great corp dev team that is very active in continuing to watch what's happening in the ecosystem around us and looking for opportunities to deploy that cash. We've done one acquisition to date last year, uh, the Keybase team that joined us, and we continue to watch for further opportunities. And those could come in the aspect of augmenting either our talent or our technology. And we, we know that there's um, some great opportunities out there and we're continuing to work towards that. So hopefully you'll see something later this year. All right, Kelly Stuckelberg, CFO at Zoom. Kelly, uh, thanks so much for joining the program once again. Hope to talk in future quarters. Thank you. Let's pick up on one part of that um, supply shortage, right, which is labor. Um, and for that, we turn to Jed Kolko. He's indeed chief economist. And Jed has been looking into, as we all have, the conundrum of why people are not going back to work. A number of states have said, well, it's because these guys are getting extra money and they've taken away that extra money, uh, at least that supplemental unemployment insurance. Jed, you've been looking into what has happened in terms of hiring and search patterns in those states. Um, and what have you ended up finding? So what we have found on our site at Indeed um, is that there was a small but temporary increase in search activity in those states that said that they would be opting out of those federal benefits. Now, that hasn't taken effect yet. Right now, uh, about 25 states have announced that they will end those federal benefits uh, starting in mid-June. So right now, all we're seeing is the effect of the announcement. Um, again, a small effect, maybe about a 5% increase in search activity in those states on the day of the announcement relative to what happened nationally. Uh, but that effect was gone after about a week. So uh, people um, heard that news, um, affected search activity a bit, um, the real question is to see what happens once those guidelines, uh, those new rules take effect. Uh, and the first states in which those take effect uh, will be uh, in mid-June. Jed, why do you think employers just can't fill these positions? Clearly, the, there are pools of people out there that need work. Companies are, in fact, stepping up, offering them more money. What is the problem here? I think there are several reasons why employers are having a harder time uh, finding workers than they and many experts expected. Um, some of the big reasons that have been with us since the beginning of the pandemic uh, is, first of all, um, many people who are unemployed uh, still think their unemployment is temporary. That is, they still think that they're on a furlough and expect to be called back. Now, many of those people who were temporarily unemployed last year have been called back. Um, but there's still a higher than normal share of unemployment um, that is temporary. Um, people are also concerned about the health risks uh, of some in-person jobs. Uh, fortunately, with vaccinations, uh, those fears should be fading, uh, but that's still a concern for some in-person jobs. Uh, and of course, the burden of uh, caregiving um, with schools and daycares still not fully open in some parts of the country uh, is an added burden, especially on mothers, uh, that is surely holding some people back. Um, I think the other thing that's a little bit newer, though, um, is that now that people are getting vaccinated and seeing good news about the economy, um, people are much more optimistic about the labor market. Uh, so there might be some people who are feeling a bit less urgency uh, around taking a job than they might have last summer, um, when there was a lot more uncertainty in the economy um, and uh, much more urgency about taking a job if you could find one. Um, 
The other thing is now that people are vaccinated, uh, people might be looking forward to visiting family um, and doing other things that they haven't been able to do for 15 months uh, and perhaps thinking about starting work um, a little bit after that. Hey, Jed, when we talk about things like childcare and vaccination or, or health risk concerns still, can you see geographically the, um, the trends in that direction? In other words, in places where schools and daycares aren't open, do you see a higher unemployment rate? In places where the vaccination rate is lower, do you see that? I mean, what kind of empirical evidence can we find to connect the dots here? So at this point, it's actually very hard um, to tease out that empirical evidence because so many things are happening at the same time. Uh, the places where vaccination rates are higher also tend to be places um, where uh, the industry mix is more skewed toward tech and finance and other jobs where people can work from home and therefore had a different pandemic economy. Uh, so the job mix, um, the rate of vaccination, um, uh, and other factors um, are all correlated. They're all happening at the same time. Same thing when we look at specific sectors. Um, some of the sectors where um, unemployment insurance benefits are a higher share relative to wages um, are also a lot of the same sectors where the in-person health risks might be higher. So even though your, your instinct's totally right to try to think about which places or which sectors um, might be more affected, um, the challenge is that a lot of the places or sectors that might be affected by one of these factors are also affected by other factors. It makes it very hard to disentangle uh, exactly why um, we're not seeing more hiring uh, right now when there are so many job openings and so many job postings. You know, Jed, speaking of um, difficult to answer questions and one that I think uh, Wall Street is certainly wrestling with right now is, is the most basic labor market question, at least as I see it, which is always, is the labor market loose right now or is the labor market actually tight right now? And I think that you look at the unemployed versus Feb 2020, it seems obvious that the labor market is quite loose. But um, are there signs in your view that it's actually a, a more competitive, a tighter situation perhaps uh, than some of that data might, might, might suggest? One of the ways in which this pandemic was so unusual um, was the huge spike in temporary unemployment, um, people who were furloughed, who expected to get recalled. When you look only at people who definitively lost their jobs, people who became permanently unemployed, um, the number of permanently unemployed people um, competing for job openings um, was actually surprisingly low compared to what we saw in the Great Recession. So in that sense, during the pandemic, the number of um, active job seekers per job opening um, didn't get nearly as high, didn't come close to where it was in the Great Recession. Um, and it's fallen back down a bit, um, starting to look like where it was before the pandemic. So by that measure, um, when we think about the number of active job seekers, uh, the labor market does look surprisingly tight, even though, again, there are lots of reasons why other people who are not working may not be actively seeking for jobs, though that could change come the fall when the kids are back in school, uh, more people are vaccinated, people have had a chance um, to take the summer. Um, so uh, we, might, we might see more job seekers uh, relative to openings once we get to the fall. And Jed, I enjoy your, your Twitter account. You recently put out a good uh, chart and a good tweet looking at children still living at home uh, with their parents because of the economic fallout. Do you think the economic recovery for the pandemic will be quality enough that children will be able to leave their parents' home within a year? I think a lot of the things that we saw during the pandemic might turn out to be temporary. Um, there was an increase, of course, in children living with their parents, an increase in people leaving, uh, especially expensive neighborhoods in some big coastal metros like New York and San Francisco. Uh, some of that might be permanent shifts, but I think a lot of that um, will turn out to be temporary. This has been such an unusual recession. Um, it affected unusual places. Um, it was much more concentrated in big cities. It affected service industries. Uh, there are lots of ways in which the pandemic uh, sped up some changes and slowed down other ones. Uh, and I think we'll discover that many of the things that we thought might be permanent effects from the pandemic um, could turn out to be temporary. 
Well, I guess we were seeing a lot of that over the Memorial Day weekend, weren't we, with a lot of people out and about. Jed Kolko, great to catch up with you. Indeed, chief economist. Everybody should check out his Twitter feed, which has a lot of great charts on all of these issues. Thanks again, Jed. Consumers increasingly say that the brands that they buy, they want them to have sustainable practices. And not only that, in many cases, they are willing to pay more for those particular brands. Uh, 39% of folks surveyed in a recent Stiefel report say that it's very important that brands operate sustainably. Jim Duffy is joining us now. He's Stiefel Sports and Lifestyle Brands Analyst who helped to put together this report. I mean, I guess it's not surprising on a certain level, Jim. We hear a lot of talk about sustainability everywhere, but what are some of the numbers that stood out to you from that survey in terms of, of the importance that people are now putting on it? Yeah, you bet. Good morning. Thanks for having me on your show. So uh, Steve had a thesis that sustainability was increasingly important to consumers as they make decisions between brands. We conducted a survey of 11,500 consumers across six different markets. And fortunately, and indeed consumers do think that sustainability is in, uh, important to their decisions. Four of five consider sustainability when choosing between brands. Um, nearly 60% of US consumers research the sustainability of brands when making uh, brand purchase decisions. So this is increasingly becoming a factor uh, in consumers purchase behavior. And we think it's gonna be a source of competitive separation for many of the brands uh, in the space. Jim, Nike and Under Armour, not on this list of, I guess, no surprise of being sustainably focused companies. At what point does that impact their stock price? Yeah, uh, so we conducted the survey with a list of 50 brands, and I'll say that each of the 50 brands are, are good actors, so it's a tough comp set. Um, Nike and Under Armour did score well uh, in the top 10 with consumers for social sustainability. They don't score as well for ethical business practices and environmental practices as some of the other brands. And so they didn't make our top 10 list overall. Um, each of them uh, and many of the legacy brands have sustainability agendas and platforms that they're uh, you're kind of retrofitting legacy supply chains, legacy business practices and so forth um, to be more accommodative about consumers' sustainability interests. You know, Jim, I thought it was really interesting some of the names on the list don't jump out to me as necessarily, you know, paragons of sustainability, even if they might have sustainable practices. Is that so? In other words, there's all there's this sort of continuing thread about a company's branding and sustainability and its actual sustainability. Um, how yeah. do you think these these companies are are doing on that front in terms of the actual sustainability? Well, so to be clear, Julie, this is consumer perceptions of brands sustainability. And so what you see on our leaderboard is a number of uh, upstart brands, brands started within the last 10 years, uh, like Bombas, like Allbirds, like Rothy's, for whom sustainability is central to their brand branding platform. Um, there are also some leading outdoor brands like Patagonia and the North Face who've been vocal advocates of environmental causes for a number of years. Uh, and then some, uh, you know, forward thinking legacy businesses like Adidas that have very evolved uh, sustainability platforms. And so, you know, there's a different, what we saw in our survey work was there's a difference between companies' actual sustainability practices and how consumers are perceiving them. Some of the companies that have very good sustainability underpinnings aren't doing as great a job of communicating that to consumers. And I think that suggests opportunity. You know, Jim, as you think about um, some of the actual practices here, one that, that stood out and, and ranks, you know, obviously highly is Bombas, where, you know, you buy a pair um, and they donate a pair. And I'm reminded of Tom's shoes from uh, back when they were kind of top of the world. You bought a pair and they donated a pair. And there were always questions around how green exactly that really was. And I'm curious how, um, you know, Bombas sort of uh, squares that circle, perhaps, um, on, on against that kind of backdrop. Yeah, uh, Bombas... It was the top performing brand in our sustainability index overall. And I think that shows that consumers appreciate their uh, attention to social causes, donating a pair to homeless shelters for every pair purchased. You know, of course, more pairs of product is less environmentally friendly, but uh, there are two other dimensions to this survey beyond the environmental component, that being the social component and the ethical business practices and Bomba scored particularly well in each of those. 
Jim, outside of the survey, I was checking out your, your coverage list. You have 11 buys and seven holds out of the companies that you cover. To me, that's a pretty optimistic outlook on the consumer in the back half of this year. What stocks are the best ones for investors to own if they want to play this economic recovery for back to school and the holiday shopping season? Sure. As you know, consumers are, uh, for the most part, quite flush with cash right now. There's a lot of pent up consumer spending. Uh, we like Nike as uh, a company well positioned to benefit from what should be a strong back to school period. Nike has made significant investments in uh, digital competencies, inventory management. Columbia Sportswear is another name where we think they're particularly well positioned into the second half of the year. Inventories in that category squeaky clean. Uh, there will be good purchases from their wholesale customers into the year and they should see consumers return to their outlet centers. So those are a couple of our favorites. And Jim, just in 30 seconds, these companies that are viewed as more sustainable, are they trading at a premium to the others and are they worth that, the ones that are public anyway? They are, um, and I do think that they're worth that. Oftentimes what you see is the brands with leading sustainability practices are, are uh, there's a lot of commonality between that and the best managed companies. Um, those companies that have the wherewithal to be uh, thoughtful and ahead of the curve on sustainability oftentimes are thoughtful and ahead of the curve on a lot of things. We've used sustainability like investments in digital and e-commerce 10 years ago, eight years ago. Those companies that are making those investments today we think are going to create competitive separation from those uh, who, are, who are lagging. Well, the NBA is rapidly expanding its footprint globally, announcing the formation of NBA Africa. The new group will oversee the Basketball Africa League, along with the league's other business in the continent. And it's got some big name investors backing this new venture, including former players Grant Hill, Joe Kim Noah, Luol Deng, and NBA great Dikembe Mutombo, who joins us today from Kinshasa, Congo. We've also got Victor Williams, NBA Africa CEO, Victor and Dikembe. It's good to talk to both of you. Uh, Victor, would love to start with you first because the NBA has had a headquarters in Johannesburg since 2010. You've been doing a lot of work there. How does NBA Africa and the formation of this new group change uh, the business for the league? Thanks, uh, thanks for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, so the NB Africa entity allows us to, is part of our growth plan for the next 10 years in Africa. And what we wanted to do was to continue to build on the foundation that we've laid over the, the last 10 years to expand the activities of the NBA on the continent, including grassroots basketball, elite talent development, uh, getting closer to our fans, being a catalyst for economic growth and social development, and uh, starting the Basketball Africa League. And with this new entity, uh, we've partnered with third party investors uh, to help us accelerate that growth. So we've been very pleased uh, to create a vehicle that allows some of the African business leaders and our NBA Africa basketball legend, such as Dikembe, to join with us, to invest um, with us, to support the growth of our game on the continent. Yeah, and Dikembe, I mean, as a player who was born in Africa, I mean, talk to me about now uh, having the ability to invest here, what it means as a player, but also as an investor, and what you hope to see come out of this new effort in Africa. To me, first, I want to say thank you for having us. Um, for me, uh, it's a dream come true. It's something that I've dreamed about. Um, we have talked about this for a long time since the creation of the NBA Africa office in 2010. We are very pleased that um, two weeks ago, we did have a chance to play our first game professionally in the continent of Africa, especially in Kigali. Now, as an investor, I can say that uh, I put my, my money where my mom feels say. So I'm very happy with the goal of the game. I think we have a chance to succeed. I don't have no doubt as I'd say that uh, we're not going to succeed in the, <laughs> this expanding of the NBA and the continent of Africa. Africa is a young continent, more yeah. than a 
800 million people living in a continent on the age of 24 years old. So we have a yeah. chance to go this game before they reach 2 billion people. And Dikembe, you know, even outside of Africa, you, you've been a global ambassador for the league for years. The last time we spoke, you were in China. So you have traveled globally looking at the NBA academies, looking at the talent and the business potential. Um, what sets Africa apart from some of these other markets the NBA has expanded into? Because the continent is so young, it's so fresh. You know, Africa becoming a place of the new discovery. It's such a youth continent. You have a great potential to grow than anything you're trying to do here. So I think for everyone who's thinking about investing in the world today, the best place for you to come is the continent of Africa. But that growth will not happen if we African people do not invest in ourselves. So what we have to do to build more arena, build more facility where our young people can go and develop and becoming a great basketball player. We cannot sit around and wait for the NBA to come do everything. NBA is not a foundation. NBA is a business, is a league. And those are the messages that we are trying to send to a lot of business people who are doing work here on the continent to be part of this. NBA cannot do everything by himself. It will bring everything that they can, but Africa have to contribute as well. Yeah, and, and Victor, I mean, it was interesting to see Jay Cole, one of those names that I think a lot of people here in the U.S. knows, uh, you know, very famous guy, playing in Basketball Africa League out there. Uh, I mean, how does it maybe build, or how do you look to build kind of the excitement over there? Are you looking to draw people to play in NBA Africa, or is it all just to be homegrown? I mean, how might that play into the strategy here? Well, we would like to continue to have the Basketball Africa League be a vehicle for, de for developing homegrown talent um, from the African continent. And so uh, the way we've designed the BAL, uh, the majority of the players are homegrown. However, in order to continue to provide great examples of higher quality play, uh, we've made provisions for a couple of players on each team to come from outside the Africa continent. And it was under that basis that J. Cole played for uh, the Patriots team from Rwanda. And going forward, um, we would expect to see that other capable uh, players, um, uh, professional players, as well as potentially um, stars who have um, you know, great basketball ability, would go through the process of being evaluated and chosen uh, by the teams in the Basketball Africa League. And Victor, finally, to what extent um, are you going to have involvement from current NBA players too? I know they've taken part in um, academies and in other parts of the world, but um, how big of a link are you looking to really create between the players currently in the league and then NBA Africa to really try to build out um, not just the opportunities, but the brand? Yes, yeah, so we continue to have great support from our uh, African players as well as non-African players in the league. Um, and because NBA Africa will be engaged in a variety of activities, there'll be a lot of opportunity for them to support uh, what we're doing. Uh, we're, we're really pleased to have the support of our legends such as uh, Dikembe, uh, but there'll be ample opportunity for our current players to support us as well. Victor Williams, NBA Africa CEO, as well as NBA legend, Dikembe Matumbo. It's good to talk to both of you. Appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you for having us. Time now for our Funding Our Future segment. I want to talk more about infrastructure with Doug Holtz Aiken, the president of the American Action Forum and the former director of the Congressional Budget Office. Doug, good to see you again. So let's start with these infrastructure talks. So you saw what Jessica just told us. The president's going to be meeting with the senator in about an hour. Over the past few weeks, you've been critical of, of, of what you've called overstimulus coming from the government as it relates to the labor market and the inflation rate. What are you going to be looking for in those talks today? Well, I think the first thing they have to agree on is what is in infrastructure and what is not infrastructure. One of the reasons they're so far apart is they haven't agreed on basic definitions. 
Uh, second thing they, they uh, have to agree on is the top line spending number and, ha and then how to pay for it, as, as Jessica said. But for me, I think the key is to make sure that this is focused on the long-term growth rate of the economy, on bolstering core productivity growth in the out years, and not rushing things to try to stimulate the economy in the near term. As you mentioned, I've, I've been worried that the American Rescue Plan, the $1.9 trillion that they put online uh, in March, is too much, and that the consequences of that will be already, in my view, asset price inflation and increasingly a, a, an upside risk on consumer price inflation. Do you think that the Republican plan to sort of pay for a lot of the infrastructure bill by redirecting money from the American Rescue Plan, money that was meant for a fight against COVID, redirecting that to infrastructure. Do you think that that's the right move? Uh, there's some merit to the notion that uh, we gave an enormous amount of funding to states and localities that did not have a revenue problem. Uh, over half the states saw year-over-year -year revenues grow, not decline. And so there, there are federal monies out there that are available for use. This is a productive use of that money. It's, it's been declared a priority by the president and, and, the, uh, con and Congress. So uh, that has a lot of merit. It's not going to pay for everything, but it's a sensible thing to do with that money. I want to uh, switch gears and talk about the monthly unemployment report from the government, which is due out this Friday. It's going to be closely watched. Some are saying it could be pivotal when it comes to whether or not the Federal Reserve is going to start scaling back its bond asset purchases and if and when the Fed is going to start raising interest rates. What are your expectations for that Friday unemployment report? I'm not expecting a blockbuster top line number. I think five to six hundred thousand jobs is a sensible number. Uh, that I think that's in the middle of the range at this point. But I think how it's put together is what really matters. Like what happens to the labor force participation rate? We're simply not going to have workers to fill the the 8.1 million openings in the economy if the labor force participation rate doesn't jump back up. It's it's well below where it was in February of 2020. Uh, the second thing that I'm looking for is uh, the role of part time work and temporary work. In this, in this jobs report. In April, we saw a real sharp decline in part-time work for economic reasons, so people were moving into full-time jobs. We saw about 100,000 temporary jobs uh, disappear from the rolls. That, that's a signal that it's full-time work that's coming back. That's a good thing. I want to see that continue. And uh, third thing is to make sure that it's broad-based growth. Uh, we, it's easy to pick up some jobs in the, the battered service sector, especially leisure and hospitality. Uh, it'd be nice to see manufacturing jobs resume growth and, and have some broad-based support for the economy. You've talked about this sort of uh, overstimulus exacerbating some of the problems that we're having right now, especially in the labor market. What do you make of some states pulling out of those extra $300 a week in unemployment benefits early before they expire? The thinking there is that they would incentivize people to get back into the workforce, especially in some of those lower wage jobs, that much sooner. Do you think that that's the right move? Certainly, we know that if the replacement rate, the fraction of your wages that the unemployment insurance benefit covers, goes up, people stay unemployed longer. That's a well-established regularity in regular labor markets. Increasingly, as we're successful in battling the virus, we're moving back into normal labor markets, and 100 percent and higher replacement rates really don't make sense. So uh, it, these were benefits that were scheduled to go away in September. To have them go away a month or two early, I don't think is a, a, a big deal from the point of view of the recovery and does free up those labor markets to function more efficiently. So we'll get to test it. We're going to see about half the states, a little more, get rid of those benefits and the other half hold on. We'll see who recovers more quickly. And I uh, want to get your thoughts on these uh, string of cyber attacks that we've been seeing in many different industries. I know I, I've been reading a number of your posts recently regarding this. And of course, just this weekend, the world's largest meat processor got hit by ransomware. Is there anything, well, I would think there is, but what should the government be doing right now to make sure that this infrastructure is, is safer? Well, I certainly think that it's important for the private sector to have a big role here, too. I mean, obviously, firms are at risk and they have to understand this is a risk they have to manage, like financial risk and, and operations risk. And, and so cyber risk, they should be prepared for. They should be getting the best technologies and, and bringing in the best people to protect their, their systems. The government has a unique position, however, in dealing with these uh, attacks from overseas, particularly Russian uh, cyber uh, attacks. And you know, having a, a real blunt conversation with the Russian government about controlling those people operating illegally in their in their borders. And and that's the place where the U.S. government can be most effective. 
All right, we're going to leave it there. Doug Holtz Aiken, president of the American Action Forum, which is a partner with Funding Our Future, an alliance we feature each week here dedicated to making a secure retirement possible for all Americans. Thanks a lot for joining us, Doug. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. Dogecoin got a new lease on life today. What started out as a joke cryptocurrency now has a market value of $54 billion after Coinbase said it would allow users to trade Dogecoin on its platform beginning this week. Here to talk about the outlook for cryptocurrencies is Jason Butcher. He is the CEO of Coin Payments. We're also joined by Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery. Uh, so Jason, good to have you here. I know that your company was the first crypto payment processor. It, it, it came to be in, in 2013, and a lot's happened in this space in that amount of time. I'm curious if if you allow Dogecoin on your platform. Yeah, absolutely. We uh, probably one of the first groups to support Dogecoin uh, really as a form of payment. We support over 2000 cryptocurrencies. So Doge has uh, definitely been a part of it. We've uh, always supported the Doge community um, between each other, providing uh, the ability to support transactions between each other, but also any merchants who uh, want to accept Dogecoin as a form of payment as well. Uh, Jared Blickery here. We have this crypto conference in Miami. I don't know if you're going to be a part of it, but there's a lot of excitement around it. Uh, a lot of institutional players there. You got your start in 2013. I went to the first Bitcoin conference down in San Jose. Things have changed a lot. Can you speak as to how serious Wall Street is taking crypto now? And is that really necessary to uh, lift it off the ground and really make it mainstream? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm not going to be at the Bitcoin conference myself, although I'm going to have some of my team there. Um, I was actually just on a phone call with uh, some of the lead uh, crypto guys from PayPal earlier, and they're all heading there and they're all, all extremely excited. So I think the biggest thing is when you look at Wall Street or you look at some of these big financial players, what the biggest change was regulation. So a few years ago, we were looking at how and what's going to happen with, with our business and other businesses in this space. and my feeling was is that as regulations come into place, it will start to move all the big players, the financial institutions, the organizations, and the likes of PayPal and, and Square and others is to when they have clear, precise ways of making sure their business is intact with their financial regulations, they'll all start playing in the, in the market. And we see that huge today. We also see a huge growth towards, towards the adoption in the finance, large financial players, as well as uh, retailers and e-commerce organizations and groups where we saw, for example, three or last year, we saw about a 300% increase in transactions just using cryptocurrency just in the last year. Why do you think it is, though, Jason, that some businesses and individuals are not taking advantage of cryptocurrency? Is it the fear factor? Is it, they, is it that they don't truly understand the space? I personally think and, and relate this to many conversations I have is that like the credit card industry, many people didn't have credit cards initially, right? And many businesses didn't accept credit cards because they just didn't know. They weren't familiar with it. They didn't trust it. They didn't have the confidence in it. And they are fearful from not accepting cash. So today, as you know, most places around the world accept credit cards as a form of payment. And I believe that crypto is starting to get to there. So there's an education process, there's an adoption phase, there is the request from their clientele. Um, so I think that whole area is starting to get bigger and bigger and bigger and more of a consciousness that, hey, cryptocurrencies are a form of payment and it can be trusted. I'd say you have a unique window into uh, some of the data surrounding crypto payments here. And I'm wondering, with uh, a lot of the tokens and coins, including Bitcoin itself, getting sliced in half over the last month or approximately thereof, have you seen a drop off in uh, crypto transaction volumes? How levered is the space to the actual price of crypto? Well, it's, it's actually a common uh, discussion that we have internally in our own team, as well as with many people, merchants especially. And really, if an individual is holding a cryptocurrency and they wish to make a purchase with that, they're going to probably prefer to make that payment, especially if their assets or their money is in crypto, compared to saying having it somewhere else. Just like I suppose you would think of, um, say, cash or credit. 
if someone has access to credit, they'll most likely use their credit card over their physical cash. So like crypto, if they're holding their funds or their assets in crypto and they don't have access to other funding means, they'll most likely make a payment using that crypto. So in our systems, for example, uh, two months ago, we saw volumes of around 700 million. This month, we saw just a slight underneath that market. So yes, there were slight changes, but that's also depending on the markets, the time of year, et cetera. But year over year, we've seen consistent, and month over month, we've seen consistent growth in the amount of transactions and the total volume of transactions that we're seeing processed. We do also see a change in some of the processing that is happening from people using uh, Bitcoin to, say, stable coins, where about 95% of the transactions used to all be in um, Bitcoin, where we started to see that to around 80%. And much more of a higher usage of stable funds. Jason, we'd just love to get your thoughts on the Federal Reserve working on its own digital currency. But they're saying that there's going to be a need for what they're calling a stable coin. So their form of a digital currency would be tied to something like the US dollar or to an asset like gold. How might that change the, the playing field for cryptocurrencies if and when that day happens? I don't think it actually changes things too much. Um, we see it happening. I sit on the board with the uh, Emerging Payments Association in, in the UK, and the British government are also putting together plans to launch a British uh, token, which is backed off of the British pound, um, similar to many Caribbean islands and organizations and, and groups. China has launched one. Um, I think if you have a stable currency that is backed by um, a fiat or backed by government issued currency, you'll have a digital wallet and a digital form of payment, but you'll still have people investing, transacting, speculating, et cetera, on the various cryptocurrencies that are out there. The only area that I would see potentially harmful is if someone said, hey, this specific currency is banned in this specific market. But even then, you still have organizations and groups that are independent looking for independent ways to hold their value, but also exchange value. In the US, as an example, there is um, the, the barter systems and billions and billions of dollars are traded globally through barter, which are simply a digital form of exchange of value and record of that value. So crypto in a way is, is essentially replacing that, but also giving the ability to transact, store value and exchange that value between uh, either party. All right, Jason Butcher, CEO of Coin Payments. Good to see you today. Thanks for being with us. All right, if you're buying a new car, a used car, you know you're going to pay through the nose to get it. Prices are up. But one of the things that's happened is people are holding on to cars. They're fixing them up themselves. And no better place to go get the parts than Advance Auto Parts. The CEO is joining us now. Tom Greco is president and CEO of Advance Auto Parts, joining us after what was a very strong first quarter earnings report. Thank you for being here. Your sales jumped 23%. Um, I like to do show and tell sometimes. This is a Bendix uh, two-barrel carburetor, Stromberg carburetor. <laughs> I rebuilt this, and I was glad I went so on your website before the show, and I can still get the kit to rebuild it. I'm a terrible mechanic. It comes from a different part of my life when I start in episodes of Jewish Mechanic. But what is driving the people buying the, the, the parts? Is it because car prices are so high now? Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Adam. We had a great quarter. And as you said, our sales were, our comparable sales were up 24.7%, which is an all-time high for us. We, we grew our margins by 466 basis points. Our EPS was up 234%. Also, an all-time high for our company. And I think the industry overall uh, had a very strong quarter. And as you indicated, uh, there are some you know, macroeconomic factors helping that. I mean, obviously the coronavirus uh, had a significant impact on consumer behavior last year that caused people to uh, start to do things themselves, you know, instead of necessarily having their car repaired at a professional garage. Uh, because they had time on their hands. They were concerned about mass transportation. To your earlier point, they held on to their cars. They didn't necessarily buy a new car. So there are a number of factors that have been uh, tailwinds for the DIY business over the last year. And the good news is now, as we all get back in our cars and start driving again, uh, that's going to drive uh, you know more repairs, more maintenance for us, and in particular, on the professional side of the house. 
Yeah, Tom, I wanted to ask you that just in terms of your DIY part of your business outperforming your pro. I mean, how long do you think, or it sounds like you've already started to see that rotate a little bit in your pro segment come back, but I guess how long do you expect this trend to continue? Yeah, well, first of all, the, the trend started, Shauna, last year in the second quarter when we saw this kind of abrupt change in, in consumer behavior. And now, as we start to lap it in, in, in April and May, uh, you know, people are starting to, you know, return to work. Uh, they're certainly starting to return to do the things that they know and love, you know, visiting their friends, visiting their family, going out to restaurants. And, and that, that means Miles Driven starts to grow. Uh, they will not have as much time on their hands as they, they did before. So that means, you know, they're probably going to get their car uh, repaired professionally. And that's why right now we're seeing professional outperform DIY, as we indicated today. And, and that's really good for us because 60% of our business is professional and we're extremely well positioned to take advantage of that trend. Um, when you talk about taking advantage of that trend, given your background, I mean, the impressive background you had uh, it, when you were over at Frito-Lay and other companies, what what lessons from that, because that's a, a different kind of business and yet so consumer facing, what lessons do you bring to that with advanced auto parts? Because I'm a car nut. I'm in your store. I'm there. No problem. But what are the lessons? Well, I mean, there's a couple of things. I mean, it's a very different business. So I will start with that. But I also I also love cars and trucks myself. I, I think uh, one of the things that I brought from PepsiCo is is brand building. Uh, brands are very important, uh, you know, in the consumer products industry, and they're very important in the auto parts business. And that's why uh, we acquired the Die Hard brand about a year and a half ago, and we've been investing behind the Die Hard brand. Uh, we advertised it last fall, featuring, of course, uh, Bruce Willis, and uh, that has been extremely successful for us. Not, not only to you know drive sales, but to drive awareness of our company. Our awareness is, is relatively low uh, as a company nationally. And, and when you have a brand like Die Hard, that really helps. Uh, obviously, Frito-Lay is, is known as a, a very strong uh, distribution organization and has an exceptional supply chain, uh, a lot of digital capabilities. So, so those are some of the things that are, I would say, transferable as you come into this environment. Tom, you also recently announced a large expansion into California, into the West Coast. Just talk to us about the opportunity that you think that presents there for the company going forward. Well, we, we, we are very excited about our announcement today. I mean, first of all, we, we announced that we are, um, you know, converting uh, 29 auto parts stores out in uh, Oregon. It's a company called Baxter Auto Parts that has been around for 80 years that know their customers, know that market extremely well. They're going to convert it over to the CarQuest banner. Uh, and then in Southern California, we have a, an arrangement with uh, Pep Boys where we're assuming the leases for 109 stores. And what that enables us to do, Sean, is get out there uh, with our, our uh, lineup and, and our uh, value proposition and back to, you know, Die Hard. We bring the Die Hard battery brand into Southern California, into Oregon. Uh, I can tell you the team members out there can't wait to sell uh, die Hard Batteries. It's got a great reputation. Uh, we bring our digital capabilities, our online catalog, our professional customers that are out there. We're able to service them. We, we weren't able to service them properly uh, when we don't have the physical uh, store presence that we have in other parts of the country. So uh, essentially, it's, it's extending uh, what has been a very successful value proposition that we've been investing in over a number of years, including um, our team members and our team members are a very important part of our value prop and we've been investing significantly in them about 60 million dollars actually over the last several years in stock that we provide to our frontline team members which is something that they're very excited uh, to hear about out in LA as we assume those leases. Tom, as you point out, nothing is forever. I mean I'm old enough to remember when you got a diehard battery at Sears and that's what a 90 year old brand. Going forward with the conversion and race to electric vehicles, does that impact where advanced auto parts might be going in the future? Well, uh, we're, we're very excited about getting into California. Uh, we, we talk about the electric trend as being deeper than it is sooner. Uh, we, we laid out uh, what is really the, the outlook for pure BEV uh, vehicles in our April Investor Day. We expect about 15 million 
uh, by the year 2030. So it's, it's going to be a gradual shift uh, given there's 280 million uh, vehicles on the road today. And, and once again, Die Hard has tremendous equity. It's an equity associated with power. Uh, we see extending Die Hard uh, into that world as it starts to unfold. Uh, we've obviously got a lot of physical buildings out there that we're going to take advantage of. But we, we sell a lot of things that BE vehicles have on them today, whether that's brakes or, or wipers or some of the other components that are part of a, a BEV vehicle. Obviously, it has a lithium battery on it. It doesn't have an internal combustion engine. But we're going to continue to look for ways to reposition our business and, and use California as a bit of a testing ground for that. I hope you will come back. It's always fun to talk cars, and the world is safer when I am not working on cars. I can tell you that. Tom <laughs> Greco is Advanced Auto Parts President and CEO. All the best to your team.